Hello everyone and welcome to this afternoon's webinar. We're happy to have people joining us today. This is the final event in the in the Fashion Means Business Takeover from London College of Fashion. I'm Professor Finola Kerrigan. I'm the Director of the Fashion Business Research Centre at London College of Fashion and I'm delighted to be here today to introduce the Digital Human Stylist Project. And I'll just get my fellow panel members to introduce themselves before we start. So, uh, first of all, Emmanuel. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Emmanuel Silva. I'm the Head of Research Coordination for the Fashion Business School. I'm also a Principal Lecturer in Quantitative Methods. Uh, Myself and my colleague, uh, Dr. Francesca Bonetti from the Fashion Business Research Center were involved in the consumer research element of this particular innovation. So that's what we'll be talking about uh, today and looking forward to uh, the discussion. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Moin, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Moin Roberts Islam. I'm the Technology Development Manager at the Fashion Innovation Agency. Um, the FIA is a team based at London College of Fashion, but we are not a research or an academic team. We're an industry facing team that goes out uh, with a remit to showcase how emerging technology can impact, disrupt and move on the fashion industry. Um, looking at the ways that brands make, show and sell their collections. And we put on proof of concept collaborations to demonstrate these technologies to, to industry and then bring those learnings back into the university and share them with the students. Great, thank you. And Lisa? Hi everybody, I'm Lisa Chatterton. I'm the business manager at the Fashion Innovation Agency, working alongside Moyne and the rest of the team. Um, my background is in um, buying and merchandising, so um, I've got a keen interest as to how these technologies might be applied within fashion and retail. And finally, Stefan. Hi, I'm Stefan Hauswiesner. I'm the CEO and founder of Reactive Reality. Uh, we are specialized in augmented reality for e-commerce. Uh, started over six years ago, and we enable online shoppers to experience products before they are buying them uh, through our patented technology. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. So um, the purpose of us being here today is to talk about the Digital Human Stylist project that was a collaboration with between everyone involved in here today. So before we talk about it more, we'll just show you what that is. So we've got a short video, and then we'll be back to the panel. Our remit is to go out and disrupt the fashion industry using emerging technology. Our vision for the future is to see how consumers can interact with their wardrobe in a new way. A digital human stylist is a digital replica of a human being. It is your smart assistant who can make intelligent recommendations on what to wear. Understand what's in your wardrobe, what's in your calendar, where you're going, who you're going to meet. The Digital Human Stylist is powered by Microsoft AI and natural language processing, which allows that interaction to just feel completely natural, as if you were just talking to a friend. It's really straightforward to capture your avatar. You take a mobile device and you do a 360 capture at three different heights, head height, chest height, and waist height. We designed the Digital Human Stylist to be interacted with in a number of different ways. A mixed reality headset, such as the HoloLens 2. Likewise, you can interact with it through a tablet device or the mobile phone in your pocket. So you're flying to Berlin this morning for some meetings this afternoon. How about this? The Digital Human Stylist is brought to life through a unique combination of augmented reality and artificial intelligence. The impact of 3D design on the supply chain is going to be profound. Less wastage, people are going to be making things which they know the customers like, and I think it's a real opportunity for brands to really have more of a personal relationship with their customers. I think there is an emotional element to retail that we quite often forget. If someone creates a moment with you or, or, or there's a kind of really natural interaction that really does change the way you feel about a purchase. The idea that you could introduce someone into your own household that you begin to form a trusting relationship with is something that could become really completely revolutionary for the industry. Great. So now uh, you get an idea of what the digital human stylist is. And before we hear more from the panel, we want to do uh, audience interaction. So we've got a few questions. And so we're going to ask uh, you to use the poll function on Zoom. I think everyone in the world is now a Zoom expert. So hopefully you've used a poll before. But uh, what we're going to do is, is pull up a poll with a question. 
and then just ask you to quickly respond to that poll and we'll share the, uh, the answer. So the first question that we have is, can you see yourself interacting with a digital human stylist? Okay, and so while well, we're waiting for that exciting answer, um, we're gonna go to the first question, which is, oh, okay. Oh, good news, 90%, 92% of people would interact with the digital human stylist. So we can all go home now, the job is done. Um, so uh, the first question is very much, uh, I'm interested to ask people how the project came about. So it's such an interesting project. So who wants to uh, let us know? I'm happy to jump in here. Um, so this project was actually the culmination of a journey of projects undertaken by the Fashion Innovation Agency. I think it was about four years ago that we first met Stefan at Reactive Reality. And um, we had, it was off the back of um, us having just launched a project at London Fashion Week, where we did the first mixed reality showcase. And it was just an, an early proof of concept. And Stefan and the team saw that and they said, yeah, we liked what you did there, but um, you should be working with us because actually we can go one better and we'd like to um, you know, do the next project with you to enhance what you did. So um, we worked with a designer called Sabina and um, we scanned her Autumn Winter 17 collection and we showcased it at London Fashion Week. And what was really great about this next project was that it had a layer of interactivity. So you were able to see the collection wearing a mixed reality headset, the HoloLens 2, and you're able to use gesture control to um, outfit build and change the, the garments on the life-size hologram in front of you. And it was really, really well re received. And we picked up an award for that project, which was fantastic. Um, and then during this time, Fashion Innovation Agency started working with Microsoft um, and Microsoft came um, and, delivered two fantastic student programs with us, um, one last year and one the year before, um, where we were actually able to provide students with access to Microsoft technologies. So mixed reality headsets, um, the internet of things and um, artificial intelligence um, capabilities. So we, we ran that in conjunction with our digital learning lab at the college. And, um, then um, sort of along the way, we were still in touch with Stefan and the team. And last year they came to us and said, we've actually evolved things further. So rather than having to do the, the capture and the photogrammetry rig as we'd done previously, they had um, developed the technology to do the capture using a mobile phone, which was just unbelievable. So last year we launched a project in collaboration with a designer called Charlie Cohen. And it was um, a virtual try on project using a mobile phone to capture the, uh, the garments and, and the model. Um, and that caught the eye of Microsoft and they, they loved what we'd, we'd done there. And they said, that's amazing. How can we work with you to then do the next the next project and so taking that 3D capture and those scans and enhancing it um, by um, using artificial intelligence to create digital humans that um, can um, you know make smart recommendations on what you can wear so the digital human stylist was born out of that conversation so it was like this journey of projects that kind of led us to this latest one. That's, that's brilliant. And um, so it takes a long time to get to this point. And uh, so maybe Stefan and Moin, you'd like to reflect on kind of what the biggest challenge was in developing the project. Moin, do you want to start or should I? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I, I think for, for us, uh, from, from our perspective, um, the biggest challenge was COVID. Um, we started the project pre-lockdown and then obviously lockdown happened and the rest of the project had to go on. By that point, um, all we got done was we'd sent the garments um, that were going to be part of the experience and that were going to be on the avatars we'd sent those off to Graz um, where Stefan's based in Austria and the plan was that Lisa and I would be flying out there scanning ourselves out there and just kind of being more involved in the process and just maybe sort of controlling it a bit more just to make sure everything was kind of as, as, as kind of perfect as we could make it um, but then obviously lockdown happened and then we really were reliant on on the technology itself at the stage it's at as Lisa mentioned kind of going from photogrammetry rig down to kind of you know just a standard mobile phone um I held it up there it didn't show <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah so just kind of doing it from, from your phone camera that was probably the biggest kind of um technical challenge sort of in terms of uh, certainly in terms of our, our feelings around it but um also just filming at home um 
because we were trying to document the whole process, do a making of video so that we could communicate it afterwards. And, you know, so part of that process was uh, Microsoft very kindly sort of helped us out with a film team and they sent over equipment and all sorts of things. But we had to, as people who weren't technically proficient in that, set up cameras, multiple cameras, multiple angles, shoot. And then I had, they had a director on a Zoom call with us. It was all just pretty mad. But uh, yeah, so scanning the garments went smoothly and everything else was kind of done just in a, in a really sort of different way to how we expected. But obviously the output was great and we were really happy with it. And Stefan, I don't know if there are any other kind of bits that you wanted to add on to that from your perspective. I can share a little bit about the technical challenges of uh, developing such a system, uh, if there's time and interest. Um, so the uh, capturing people in 3D photorealistically is, is considered to be a holy grail of computer vision. This is, this is something that is really challenging and it goes much and far beyond capturing static objects, capturing static objects, you know, like, uh, you know, like, like a, a tea mug is something that is very simple, but capturing people is extremely hard because people move while being captured, you know, they, they blink, they breathe, um, and the appearance of, of humans is incredibly complex. You know, we have hair, we have glasses, we have skin tones, we have skin textures and all that. And people are particularly picky when they look at their own avatars. Uh, so there is a lot of technical challenges that, that make capturing humans photorealistically particularly hard. Um, and we've developed to this end a, a stack of technologies consisting of machine learning, photogrammetry, and image-based rendering to solve many of the sub-problems. And I don't want to go into the detail of all of those, um, but they culminated in this uh, digital human stylist project where um, it was very good that we can use mobile phones, right, to capture because the you know it, all the travel was prohibited, and uh, so th this why this is why we could uh, pull off this very nice project and really really create a, a flagship in, in digital humans and, and virtual humans, uh, despite Corona. Great. Um, I want to try another poll now um, because the the digital human project allows. Uh, different types of interaction, so speech, gesture, uh, text. So um, do you want to explain, I want to ask a little question about that, but would one of you want to explain a bit more about how you thought about speech, ge gesture, and, te and, and sorry, speech, gesture, and text in terms of the design of the digital human stylist? Yeah, I'm happy to answer that one. So I think um, we had various discussions about it and we wanted to make it as simple as possible. And I think for us, um, we're also looking at that evolution. So when we had done a, the, the last project using um, the HoloLens and the, the mixed reality um, interactive experience, it was about using gesture control. But for this project, we were using the HoloLens too. And we were able to showcase how you could use Microsoft's na natural language processing to take that information and give you the results that you wanted. So we wanted to think about the most natural way that you would be interacting with someone. And, and for me, that's going to be, you know, by speaking, by talking to that, that human. Um, and we were really impressed that we were able to, to deliver on that, where we were able to, you know, say where we were going, what the outfit was needed for and then to be able to um, get the response and say whether we liked it didn't like it show something else it was um yeah it was interesting to see how capable it was of um, responding to the voice that's brilliant <clears throat> so i'm going to see how uh, people in the audience feel about those three things so we're going to ask our second poll question which form of interaction is most important when for you when actor uh, interacting with a digital human stylist speech text or gesture so I wonder, will everyone be like Lisa? I think I prefer speech as well, as long as it understood me. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not sure what people came up with. So, so yeah, speech, <clears throat> yeah, kind of overwhelmingly popular. So I think that justifies the investment in speech technology. And I think I also, because reflecting back on what Stefan said about how people feel about what, about what these avatars are and so on, uh, I think we'll go straight into our third poll, um, which is what would you prefer in terms of what your uh, digital avatar, digital human stylist looks like? And I guess that was a big design decision. So the question is, what would you prefer in terms of the appearance of your digital human stylist? Identical twin, not identical, but similar body shape 
or it looks entirely like someone else. So that's really interesting. Because I think we use a lot of avatars in other contexts where it doesn't matter, but this is a very specific one if we're looking at it for, in terms of the human stylist. So let's see what people said. Ah, okay. So identical twin is fairly popular, but not identical, but similar body shape. So we want a kind of, you know, maybe a reinvigorated version of ourselves. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Um, so um, who do you think will be the main users? So in the video, we covered a few different kinds of users, but um, maybe Lisa and Emmanuel. Lisa, from your perspective, uh, developing it, and Emmanuel, based on some of the research that uh, you and Francesca Bonetti um, did, I'm not sure who wants to go first. Um, so from a development perspective, um, when we were um, designing this, this proof of concept, we were thinking about, you know, the different use cases for this digital human stylist. And I think to, to my mind, um, you know, this is going to prove most beneficial for anybody who wants to make the most of their existing wardrobe, mm -hmm. you know, with a keen eye and sustainability and being able to, you know, reach into the depths of their wardrobe and find things that they haven't worn for some time, but be able to style things in new ways. I think we were also conscious of wanting to show, demonstrate, you know, the capability of the, the AI and looking at, um, you know, how the digital human stylist could make recommendations based on your calendar. So, you know, which events you were going to, who you were going to be seeing, if you were traveling, if you, there was a particular dress code, the weather, all of those things came into play, but we were trying to show how it could be really smart. So I think at that point, I was thinking this would be perfect for somebody with a really hectic lifestyle who attends lots of, you know, social and work events and travels quite widely um, and needs to be able to make those outfit builds quite quickly and would, you know, really benefit from having the, um, the, uh, the machine learning, the AI to be able to kind of give that instant feedback as to um, you know pieces in their wardrobe um, and I think you know the benefits of this are that it, it really does allow you to make the most of what's already in your wardrobe without having to think about always having to buy something new um, but at the same time from a sort of like a uh, you know like a, a business to business perspective it's also really interesting to see how brands will um, adopt this technology so that they can actually be the ones to you know infiltrate and make those recommendations to you knowing full well what you already have and you know recommend pieces which will work well with what you already have in your wardrobe great emmanuel what did the what did the consumers say yeah so i think i can give slightly different insights in terms of the quantitative research that we conducted so we had a sample of 357 respondents now it's important to remember that these people hadn't seen the video that the uh, audience today saw. So it was about explaining the product to them based on text, uh, visuals, and uh, different types of images and video. Uh, but it was really interesting that in the target population, which was 18 to 44 year olds, all of them were really positive towards actually interacting with the digital human and also wanting to use this particular product at the end. But in terms of gender, we noticed that whilst both males and females were positive towards using it, males had a significantly higher average response than the females in terms of the attitude towards actually using this particular innovation. Uh, if we broke it down, I think by, let's say, employment status, we noticed that students and those who are employed were more positive towards using it than those who were not employed or not uh, working at the moment. And even with income levels, we did see some differences in the fact that people who were earning between, let's say, 10K to 70K in terms of pounds uh, were more positive than people who were earning more than 70K or people who were earning less than 70K, uh, earning less than 10K in terms of uh, actually using the digital human stylist in their work. Uh, but as I said, this was definitely based on uh, a story that we created for them. And it was amazing to see the answers to the first poll where the interaction levels were much higher than what we were able to get uh, at the survey. But yeah, I think that covers most of those things. 
I think that gives us at the Fashion Business Research Center a lot of uh, food for thought in terms of future research, because it'd be great to explore more like why these things happened and so on. So um, brilliant. Um, I think uh, I'd like to ask now, all collaboration is a challenge. So, and you talked about some of the challenges uh, that you faced. Um, what, what do people think the kind of biggest challenges are for industry and academia collaborating? So we always hear, you know, people want more collaboration between academics and industry. Um, what prevents that? What, what, when does it, why does it work well when it works well? Anyone want to come in? I don't know, Lisa, probably you uh, have good thoughts on that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, when we're doing these proof of concepts at the Fashion Innovation Agency, um, we're working with commercial partners. And a lot of the time, you know, they want a really quite quick turnaround um, on these things. And I think um, sometimes what we find is, you know, our timeframes versus the academics time frame frames don't always align. Um, and, you know, it may well be because, you know, their, their research is already plotted through the rest of the year. And we're kind of like, you know, want to turn things around in a matter of months. Um, but I think what's been really interesting for us, um, having worked with um, the Fashion Research Centre, is the fact that um, you were able to respond really quickly um, to this particular brief. Um, and likewise, we're working on a project together at the moment. And, you know, that's been a really rapid turnaround. Um, it's been a matter of months. So it's been incredible to be able to see how agile the centre has been, being able to, um, you know, adapt and, and work with us on these sorts of um, projects. Yeah, yeah. No, I think I can... Go on, Emmanuel. I think I can really add to that because uh, I was thinking along the same lines as Lisa. I think it's it's about two different people coming together with different expectations. So end of the day, it's how well you can manage those expectations. And I think the innovation agency and the stakeholders were very uh, direct about what they wanted to find out from the project. And then at the same time, we were able to be very honest about what we can deliver within the given time frames and within the resource constraints that we had. So I thought that really helped us to work very well together there. Uh, but I can think of one other uh, issue which or challenge, which I think is a problem in trying to collaborate with business that would be accessing the actual data for research and development and obviously converting it into a publication. Now, obviously working with FIA, we've not had that problem because at the outset, we always discuss how we can take this forward beyond the project into a publication. But I think in general, it's possible that when you're working with businesses, they can be very protective of their information for very uh, uh, acceptable reasons. But I think it's important to find a way to navigate through that as well, uh, if we are to proceed uh, successfully in collaboration. I think there is something about the building up trust and kind of long-term research. So, so you talked about, um, so FIA have collaborated with Reactive Reality or built up a relationship with Reactive Reality so you kind of know what each other is looking for, but also you know the academics and you know maybe who's responsive and who isn't over time. So that might kind of work. Um, okay, very good. Um, so getting back to this kind of idea of augmented reality, we do hear a lot about the potential of augmented reality. Um, what do we see as the kind of the major kind of um, advantages to using this in fashion? And then what would the kind of key challenges be in, in moving towards a, a more use of augmented reality? So Moin, Stefan. Okay. Um, so th the way we see it is that augmented reality enables people to experience products before they buy them online. And this is a very, very powerful concept because at the moment when you look at online shopping, all the web shops look the same, right? For the for the end user, for the shopper, it doesn't quite matter where they buy from, uh, unless they have different brands. And this, we don't see that this is going to be the experience that will really persist any longer, right? When we look five years into the future, there will be no question that we interact, uh, you know, not only with fashion but with with our friends, with everything really digital, um, in a natural way through AR and through voice and speech. And we, I, I can't see that, you know we will continue to stare at flat screens and flat websites for so much longer because that is not, not the way humans work, right? And in, in, in e-commerce, it has a huge and immediate potential, right, of lowering return rates and, and making people 
feel more comfortable with shopping. Um, but this goes much, much beyond that, right? If, if you have a virtual avatar of yourself, uh, it can help you in your, you know, when, when you're exercising in your health and fitness uh, efforts. Uh, it can be, you know, the, what we are doing here now, teleconferencing, uh, there's already virtual backgrounds, kind of cool, but um, imagine this being in 3D, you know, all of us sharing a common space, keeping eye contact while we are talking. I think this is where the direction is going. Uh, and uh, yeah, through projects like the Digital Human Stylist, we, you know, we can sort of map the path of, of really the future. And I think I can just add to the returns uh, discussion there because we did some did ask some questions during the survey, and actually seventy three percent of the respondents uh, did expect that they would return less if they had access to the digital human stylist when buying online. So I think there is a huge potential here to encourage more sustainable uh, sustainable consumer behavior in the long run if we can get this out to uh, the, the masses. Yeah. And then just another advantage that kind of, you know, just on the creative side, you don't have to be based in reality. You know, we're augmenting things that designers can actually really maximize their creativity and think about embellishments or augmentations that, that you just can't do in real life, that, you know, can't take place or something that takes over the whole environment, kind of covers it in your, your inspiration, your designs. Um, it, just, it just allows a lot more freedom. and just gives a lot more areas for those designers to go into rather than just kind of physical products. Um, but then the second part of the question was about the sort of challenges around that. So for the FIA and you know, some of the things that we're looking at, especially with regard to um, AR experiences, um, one is the lighting uh, in particular, you know, if you're doing something in a location, the lighting might be different from the, lo uh, from the location where you did the scanning, for example. So in, in this one with, with reactive reality, you know, we, we had certain light conditions where, when we captured ourselves and, you know, it's kind of easy to replicate that because the, um, the avatar was then in our homes with us. So it was, you know, same, the same lighting conditions, but had we scanned in a really bright condition, then you were sort of placing it somewhere where it's just sort of spotlit. It wouldn't feel like it was placed, you know, realistically in that environment. So that kind of contextual lighting is, is quite an important challenge to kind of look at going forward. Um, contextual scanning of the space as well for placing those um, AR augmentations so that um, they kind of behave uh, naturally within that environment they're aware of other objects they don't walk through tables um you know just uh, and you know if they're picking something up putting something down it's kind of it just keeps that uh, layer of immersion and realism so that you you genuinely trust and build up a relationship with that digital human stylist um and then just other things like depending on the hardware you're using if it's a sort of tablet or a phone the you know the graphics quality is pretty good if you're using a headset um you know if you're using uh, an older model the polygon counts quite small so you have to kind of accept that the the output's not going to be so realistic but you know we were lucky enough to use hololens 2 for this one so you know the polygon count was higher gave from you know made for a more immersive realistic experience um and then one last thing is maybe off device processing so with the advent of 5g um rather than uh expecting the, the device in your hand to be doing all the processing um you can then use 5g to stream off device do all the computation, all the kind of modeling, all the rendering off device and just stream it directly to your phone, you know, huge amounts of data in a very short space of time that will kind of allow for kind of more development in those areas. But that, those are the kind of challenges we've been looking at. I don't know if Stefan, there is anything else you wanted to add on the challenges side. Oh, no, this was perfect actually, thanks. <laughs> Great, and you brought up some interesting things that we'd like to get some audience reaction for. And the first one was this question of, um, of return. So we hear a lot about this because, you know, with the rise in online shopping, one of the biggest things is people feel they just keep ordering and then they can keep sending them back. So that idea that you can actually get things that are much more, you're more, you have a higher level of confidence about their fit. So our next exciting poll is whether people would expect fewer returns when purchasing outfits suggested by your digital human stylist. Uh, so we'll be interested to see what people think. It's a bit like having a, someone in a shop who you ask to help you pick out an outfit, but you don't always know if you can trust their taste, right? Right, so yeah, th so that's brilliant. Uh, so that people do think that they would, so, um, so that's really good news. And then, and then the, other the other question, I think we'll go straight to our next poll because Moyne um, raised the issue of like which device. And I think that's the thing that when we want to use these technologies, it's very dependent on uh, on people having compatible devices. So the next poll 
is what is your preferred personal device for interacting with your digital human stylist? So do people prefer the smartphone, smartwatch, tablet, AR headset or VR headset? And this will be very interesting to find out. And Emmanuel, these, you asked these questions in the, in the research, did you? Let's see how, how the audience compares to uh, what was found in your, in your research. Smartphone. Okay, yeah, so we still love our phones, don't we? Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's really interesting. Um, okay, and Emmanuel, did that compare well to the research that you collected? No, that's right. The smartphone was on top and the headsets uh, were definitely, I think, slightly more uh, preferred than the smartwatch, if I remember right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and just a quick question for Stefan. So Stefan, if you're developing th these technologies, do you find um, that retail organizations are very, very positive about them? Or are they still a bit cautious? Or what's the, what's the kind of industry feeling about investing in these technologies? Uh, this is something that is very much in motion, um, especially this year. So, you know, before this year, retail, the retail industry was rather conservative when it comes to innovation. Uh, but this year, through Corona, to be honest, we just saw an acceleration of developments, developments that were going on anyway, and that is that um, everything is moving online, and that has taken a huge boost, of course. Uh, now, with respect to doing business, 2020 was probably not great. Uh, however, the awareness for, for these technologies has, has risen considerably. Uh, people realize that uh, we need to prepare yeah, for a world where you know, we, we don't go to the store all the time. And people got used to online shopping, frankly, during during all these lockdowns. Um, so there is a huge shift going on. And uh, definitely a, a good field for innovation now. Yeah, it was interesting looking at when people were doing online shopping and there was a shift. So during the day, people were doing online shopping. Um, okay, so that's, that's really, um, really, that's one positive from COVID, can we say? I think there have been some positives from COVID. Um, so, so that brings us a little bit, you know, are there any other kind of things that COVID has? I think, uh, you know, colleagues in FIA, I know you've been working on a lot of different projects. Um, what other kind of pluses and minuses have there been around innovating in technology spaces and COVID? I think the biggest thing has just been, you know, that huge switch to um, online shopping. Um, and people's expectations now, they, they want more and more. They're like, you know, we're bored of just kind of endless scrolling through two dimensional products. Um, and I think there's a huge opportunity um, and we'll see some examples of this coming up, you know, for um, brands to adopt more virtual um, immersive shopping experiences. Um, and of course, augmented reality forms part of that. And I think what will also be interesting is, you know, how our behavior might change when we finally can shop again in physical retail um it's going to be some time before it completely returns to normal and you know um this technology really lends itself well to things like virtual try on and we've seen you know some fantastic results with brands uh, particularly like makeup brands using ar apps and you know integrating live chat and just making those experiences more personalized and just more fun and more exciting. So I think, you know, COVID certainly has been a bit of a catalyst for, for, um, for change in that respect. And, and, and I hope, you know, we will see a lot more um, exciting things to come over the next sort of six to 12 months. If I can... A lot of our nervousness about these things, we've just had to put it to one side and just push on because there's no option. I think that's what people have seen. If, if I could just add to that, I think there's also been a sort of tangential benefit that, you know, obviously we're all at home, there's very little for us to do. Um, so, you know, services like Netflix and so on have just become very, very popular. And there's a demand for more and more new content, you know, kind of the, the production of all these things has obviously necessarily ceased. Um, and so people have to find new ways to do that. So that's kind of driven the acceleration of those technologies to some way, uh, in some way. So, you know, you, you have to be able to create more and more virtual content in more and more sort of exciting and probably more digital ways um, and that acceleration that kind of focus on, on on those things in other industries is again going to have tangential benefits for the fashion industry I mean already we've seen you know with fashion weeks 
you can't have a physical fashion week so then they're having digital fashion weeks and you know kind of at the beginning we saw that in a very tame way with people just doing video presentations but you've seen as, as kind of um the years gone on people are being more and more experimental they're doing digital catwalks or they were just doing you know digital videos and putting them online but now people are sort of almost starting to get into mixing digital with physical and and you know the kind of acceleration of all of those technologies especially in the tv field with sort of virtual production and so on making shows with kind of digital backdrops that make you feel like you're somewhere else when you're not actually that that can then come into the real world so there's, there's a whole bunch of kind of not necessarily new technologies but new areas new opportunities that are kind of being pushed towards the fashion industry and people are kind of a bit more open to taking them on now whereas i think at the start of the year they they certainly wouldn't have been and even just from a funding perspective as well uh, for these technologies um, because of a necessity to develop them that the funding pools are out there and then you're getting creatives from industries who aren't necessarily the obvious ones it's like fashion coming in and saying actually we can think of some ideas for how to develop that technology or how to use it and it's just kind of making everyone a lot more creative and a lot more open and slowly 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 the brands are also following suit they're sort of dipping their toes in and you're getting the odd brave brand here and there that's trying this out trying that out and projects like this one allow us to visualize the output that we've been talking about for so long you know we've been talking about digital humans we've been talking about augmented reality we've been talking about all these things and fashion brands traditionally have been quite reluctant and worried and like what's the quality of that output how's it going to reflect on our brand how, how you know will, will it look as perfect as it should do and now we can actually show them yeah here's what it looks like here's where the technology is actually at um and it really is good enough it is exciting it does create a buzz it does create engagement um just one quick thing we've, we've also seen you know augmented reality online in terms of sales uh, has had a huge increase i mean spotify did one piece of research where they said it uh, increased uh, sales by 250 uh, percent if you had an ar asset um of of, of the item uh, online it just shows that people are ready to engage with this kind of content we just need to start producing it yeah, I remember teaching about all the possibility for this, you know, 15 years ago. So, <laughs> so it's good to see a little bit of progress. Um, so uh, we've got some questions already, and uh, I'd like to ask the audience to start thinking of any more questions because we, we're just we're going to come to you in a minute. Uh, but I just want to kind of round it up by uh, asking what people are working on now. So what we've seen through this panel is this is a kind of continuation of a of kind of a journey for everybody in terms of, of research. So Stefan, could we go to you first and ask what kind of exciting cool projects will we see from Reactive Reality? Mm. So the way we see augmented reality in, in e-commerce and fashion shopping is uh, that we want to make this an everyday technology. So we are working very hard on bringing this scalability um, to these systems. Um, it is you know, it's one thing to to run a project with you know five avatars and ten products. Um, our our goal, and we have made great progress towards that, is that all the products in in a fashion store can be experienced online, and this requires uh, a huge amount of scalability. And uh, for example, with our partner Ux Neta Porter, we've achieved a system where uh, where there's millions of tens of millions of outfit combinations that you can uh, actually mix and match uh, in a mobile app. And that, um, that is a game changer because previously to create these outfit combinations, you would have to photograph all of them on a live model that would you know, take 500 years to do that. Um, so a lot of the excitement for us is in the scalability and rolling this out, uh, making it an everyday technology because when you know, there is no question that people will use AR in the future as an everyday technology, but for that, it requires a whole lot of content, right? To make it exciting that, you know, you've got to digitize the whole world. And our goal is to do that, right? We start with e-commerce, we digitize all the products and all the people, and that is already a super exciting uh, first step. And then we can move even uh, beyond e-commerce, as I mentioned before, you know, video conferencing, 3D, health and fitness, um, gaming, you know, you can, you can create your favorite gaming avatar to look exactly like yourself. So you will be the hero in your favorite game. Um, so there's nearly limitless applications for that. So you're going to be pretty busy. Oh, <laughs> uh, yep. <laughs> and Emmanuel, are, uh, oh, yeah. and we'll do more. Okay, good. Emmanuel, what are, what are you working on? Yeah, I think at the moment, uh, something very exciting, which I can announce today is perhaps the fact that uh, the Fashion Business School has been working together with, again, businesses collaborating with businesses on developing a new course. And we'll be launching this exciting new course in September 2021. 
It's the first of its kind. Uh, it's going to be a master of science in fashion analytics and forecasting, and it will be delivered entirely online. So we are very excited, but I think what was really amazing was to see businesses come in and co-create the curriculum and even the assessments so that it ensures that everything is very current and industry relevant. So it was very exciting. And I think it just calls for more and more collaboration with the business and academia moving forward. Thanks. Great. And uh, Lisa and Moyne, what's, what's on the uh, FIA agenda? So um, immersive retail, let's say, is a big one for us. Um, we're running a few projects. Um, we're also um, doing a few uh, student facing activities um, right now. Um, we um, have run an Unreal workshop um, for um, students to be able to um, understand about how they can use the um, Unreal Games Engine to create 3D content. So that's really exciting being able to bring, you know, opportunities into the college through our connections. Um, and um, we're, yeah, we're doing another um, couple of uh, collaborative challenges around immersive e-commerce and um, digital fashion as well. Great, and it's, uh, it's, it's fantastic for us at the Fashion Business Research Center to be able to collaborate on some of those projects. So it's a real, it's a real boost for us. So I think we're gonna move over to the questions now. I'm delighted to see a former colleague of mine has a great question. Uh, so a question from Ghana. Um, how do you deal with different fabrics? So different the, the way leather looks different from wool, that if, might affect how different clothes fit each other. So who's best to come in on that? Um, well, basically it comes down to the sort of simulation software. So in terms of the look of those uh, different fabrics, you can capture those photorealistically in, in the process that reactive reality used. You know, if you're if you're using photogrammetry as a sort of basis for that, it is the actual look of that of that fabric. In terms of the fit and modeling that on a model, um, that becomes a bit more complex. And it, as as I sort of say, it kind of it relies on the power of the software that you're modeling that software um, the fabric in. If you're doing it in kind of a uh, just kind of pattern cutting sort of software. There are simulations, they're not necessarily so good, but there are a lot of companies out there that are looking at cloth simulation in isolation uh, and modeling these different fabrics. And, and the results are really, really promising. Um, we, we've seen recently one example where it's a, an AI algorithm that was trained to, to model different fabrics and kind of do that in real time. And, and the results are really, really impressive. So there are kind of leaps and bounds being made there, whether that's kind of ready for everyone to use right now and just to kind of go sort of straight off the bat probably not yet but you know in isolation you'll see lots of projects where, where that's being done in a very impressive way um but yeah animating a, a a fabric is always is always a tricky one to do it to a really kind of high degree but you know you've got fashion houses like the fabricant out there doing that sort of thing um sort of in a specialized way but it's becoming more and more accessible to more and more people as the as the software improves Oops. Okay, um, the next question uh, is one that I'm very interested in as well. Uh, are there plans in the pipeline to cater to the hearing impaired? Speech would not work for them. Uh, so my mother is hearing impaired. So I think that's a really good question. At the moment, we, we're not, we don't have any plans in the pipeline to, to be working on that. But I think, um, you know, to the, to the other um, suggestions that were put out there when we did the previous poll, um, People can also interact with this digital human stylist either via text or through gesture control. So, you know, shaking the head or swiping the hand if the results you're given aren't your satisfaction would be enough to give you a, a different result. And just to add to that, I mean, um, when we did the first project that Lisa described, the one with Sabina, the gestures were, it was just one gesture. There's something called the power tap where you just do that and you sort of pinch in front of the object and it would it would cycle through through the different options. But then when the HoloLens 2 came out and sort of uh, other sort of similar AR headsets, the hand tracking on those headsets is a lot better. Um, and you can do a, a number of different sort of hand gestures. Uh, and then you, you'd be able to sort of, depending on, on the app you create, you could get each different hand gesture to, you know, mean a different output. So potentially there's, there's kind of more in-depth ways of communicating rather than just the kind of immediate sort of shake and nod and thumbs up you could you could probably go a little bit more in depth 
there's also that ability to kind of use a sliding scale press you know all those kinds of things so you could you could build a visual interface within that AR environment to make it a bit easier and then again you could use text and so on within that great uh, so we have two questions that are similar <clears throat> um, about data security and so on so from uh, somebody whose name is not appearing on the poll has the security implications been considered with the technology in the age of deep fakes where this technology can be misused similar to how Facebook is being misused and similar to that um, I think that uh, Ghana asked a question about what data um, will be held so who wants to come in on the privacy data side? Um, so I can comment at least from the technical side, and we've spent a, a lot of effort on making this system secure, uh, not only through encrypted data transfers and storage. Um, the, the goal here is really that once you've created your digital human stylist or in general your avatar, it will reside on your phone or on your device in general. Um, and will not and does not need to leave the device for all the applications. Uh, so the fitting engine and the, the sizing and size recommendation engine all runs on the device, uh, such that once you have your avatar, you're safe, right? Um, and it's on your uh, personal device only. Um, this this is the best level of safety you can have. That there is no server system that can be hacked. That's good. Um, so, and this is a question that I was thinking about as well, this uh, another anonymous uh, question. When it comes to finding new clothing, I'm personally swayed by the textile and how the material feels on my body. Is there a way that this could be incorporated to the digital stylist? So that's always the big question. What about touch? Well, I think to begin with, you know, this proof of concept takes garments that already exist in our wardrobe. So we had pieces scanned from, you know, pieces that we already owned that we could touch. I think the point of this was to demonstrate how quickly and rapidly you can have these virtual try-on experiences without having to physically go into your wardrobe, find those garments, take them off the hanger, get undressed, try them on, all the rest of it. So I think, you know, for this particular project, there's, there's already that understanding of, I know what that particular jacket or skirt or whatever feels like. Um, I think, um, when we think beyond, um, you know, what we already own and, you know, um, amalgamating, um, you know, products from a from a brand into that experience, of course, you know, we're still not there yet in deciphering um, what what those those um, textiles feel like. Um, you know, we've, we are interested in looking at what's out there, you know, looking at haptics, looking at, um, you know, technologies which can um, scan materials and provides information on that. But I think we're still not there. We're, you know, we're, we're still trying to solve that that piece of the puzzle. I don't yeah. know if more you want to add to that. Yeah, just, 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 yeah, just to kind of just follow on from that. There's, there's kind of two ways to get around that. One is, um, you know, we take in a lot of our sort of texture information visually. You know, you see the way a fabric is moving or behaving or changing in the light, and you've got some sense of what that fabric's like, how transparent it is, how it might feel to the touch. And that's kind of the most obvious way to communicate that information currently. But uh, in terms of the actual touch, as Lisa said, haptics is probably the least developed field in terms of uh, modeling a garment. Um, it's, it's quite a tricky one. You'd need very specialist equipment. The, the, the kind of feedback and, and the interfaces are always quite tricky. It's, it's probably the youngest field in terms of all the senses, in terms of incorporating senses into, into an experience. Touches, simulating touch is, is a really tricky one. So I think we're quite a few years off from that, unfortunately, on that purely tactile sense. But visually, we've got a lot of the information. Okay, so we've got 10 minutes left. We've still got a lot of questions to get through, but um, two questions I think are kind of on similar, around similar themes. So from Anna and from Ghana. So Ghana talks about, you know, as a behavioral scientist, she understands how difficult it is to get people to interact with this. So even though it does appear very natural, uh, how do we think people will kind of mainstream it? And also kind of link to Anna, uh, who asks about the scalability. So. <clears throat> Sorry, do we think this will be introduced earlier in the supply chain um, kind of interacting with the digital stylist? What needs to happen for it to be scalable? Um, I can say a few words at least. Um, you know, th th there is several factors to the scalability. One is the content, which we've already uh, talked about a little bit. It is uh, capturing 
all the products in, in 3D and capturing all people in 3D. And then there is the scalability of the devices uh, that people are consuming the experience with uh, as far as that goes. Um, you know, cross device compatibility is increasing uh, rapidly um, and we are definitely benefiting from that. And uh, for example, our technology run, runs on iOS, Android, Windows, um, all the uh, Windows mixed reality um, headsets, all the Oculus headsets. Um, so at least from a, from a device perspective, I think this is uh, not, a, not a big concern, even runs on the web, so. Um, a couple of kind of questions. So the uh, Anne, um, Anne Kush uh, asks, are we working on 3D models and are we thinking of uh, working on real human pictures? But I think, I don't know, I think they, you were real humans, right? You weren't 3D models. No, we're definitely real. <laughs> I hope I haven't misunderstood the, the question. Um, and then a great question on um, whether graduates can do, fashion graduates can do VR shows to showcase their work. And I think our colleagues in FIA are well placed to answer that question. Yeah, we um, did our first um, virtual reality fashion showcase back in July. Um, and we worked with um, Riot Studios, the creative agency of Verizon. And what we did is we selected three fashion designers one of whom was a recent graduate from the college. And we partnered each of those designers with a 3D artist. So working collaboratively, um, those 3D designers were able to create these virtual story worlds, um, which were able to express the vision of the designer. So, you know, taking inspiration from their collections, um, creating um, you know, replicas of the, their garments um, and you're able to just have this really fully immersive experience if you're wearing a VR headset. Um, and what was really cool about this is we, um, we did it as a, a live event. So the, the actual experiences were housed within the Museum of Other Realities and um, participants were able to walk around this um, 3D immersive environment and we're able to actually interact with other avatars. So each participant, you know, appeared as a, an avatar, um, just some shapes. And you were able to, um, you know, see other participants and they, they, you know, their names were above their heads and you're able to kind of communicate with them and explore, explore these worlds together. Um, and it was just really cool to be able to see, you know, virtual reality being used um, in fashion communication in a way that, you know, we haven't really seen before. Um, and so it'd be interesting to see, you know, how, how designers and brands start using more of this technology in the future. And albeit if you didn't have a VR headset, you could still, you know, view it on a, a web browser. Um, so, you know, it, it, it was a, it, the barrier wasn't, you know, fully there if you didn't own the VR headset, it's just you didn't have as immersive, an immersive experience. And just to quickly add to that, Fanula, if I may, just um, for if if the question was geared to what can other graduates do for their collections, um, the you know the, the ability to scan and digitize physical garments now is is kind of just it's more widely available. You can use the photogrammetry route that we we have here, or you can digitally recreate your products in Clo, Optitex Browseware. All of these softwares are offered uh, to LCF students um, through the Digital Learning Lab uh, and on some of the courses as well. Um, and then you can put them into an, a gaming environment, unit, uh, Unity or Unreal, as Lisa mentioned, we're running an Unreal course now for students um, to then put those 3D assets into a game environment, animate them, create your own virtual catwalk um, presentation, whatever it may be. So the technologies are there. We have access to them at LCF. Uh, it's just a case of just rolling up your sleeves and, and getting involved and, and learning it. It's, you know, it's picking up a new skill. It will take time, but the opportunities are there to do that. Um, there's a question about um, from Ying, who is saying that she's on the fashion design management program at the moment, and they're doing projects in 3D design using CLO3D, if that's how you say it. Um, and can that be uh, applied in the digital human stylist? Is that too uh, tech? Yes, that's, that's a, a possible data okay. import path. Okay, perfect. Um, and then um, 
Is there any automation behind building the 3D avatar from the from picture to model, or is it manual? There is a lot of automation behind. Um, at the moment, there are still some manual steps, but those are diminishing uh, as we speak. And uh, we offer actually several avatar generation methods. Some of them are fully automated. Um, so there, there is a, yeah, there's different ways of doing that, and and some of which are already fully automated, and they work within minutes. So we have, uh, we've got a few other questions. I think what we, we can't ask all the questions. So we will go through and try and send answers or keep the dialogue going with people. Um, but um, I have one question is, uh, this is might be a bit negative, but this could lead to certain jobs being lost. So there was two questions, one about cutting out the middleman about fitters and uh, model fitters. Uh, and, and and a more broad question about will will this get rid of certain jobs? What any answers? Any positive answers? I'll have a go. <laughs> um, well, with any new technology, I mean that's what happens. You know, you kind of replace the old the old processes. Um, you know, the, the advent of a sewing machine changed a lot of jobs, and you know, hand stitches kind of lost their jobs, and then uh, automation in factories then removes jobs from from people who, who are sewing on sewing machines and and each time new jobs come in that in 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 their place um you know a digital industry requires a lot of digital artists a lot of a lot of input a lot of people who know how to use a software integrate it create a realistic immersive experience for the end consumer and just apply them in different contexts so there are new skills to be learned new jobs to be created um, even the advent of, of, of the smartphone has changed the way that, that things are marketed. You know, Instagram is something that just didn't exist. And yet immediately all brands have moved to advertising and selling on Instagram. TikTok's another one where it's all picking up. It, it is taking away some people's jobs, but I don't think people are complaining about that. People are just kind of embracing it and, and moving with it. This is no different. It's just another avenue. It doesn't mean everyone has to do it. It doesn't mean everyone will do it. But some people will, some people will maximize those opportunities and it will create uh, a new kind of revenue stream and therefore will create jobs and therefore will create an infrastructure. So kind of as the old one declines, a new one kind of increases. I don't know if it's kind of commensurate, does it even out? Hopefully, but I don't know at that large, large scale. Hopefully that's positive. Brilliant. That is very positive. Uh, and I think uh, we don't have time for any more. There are some questions about getting in touch. I think everyone is a bit is kind of willing to carry on the conversations, get other ideas for collaboration or other interesting projects. Um, and so I just want to thank the panel. I think we could have gone on for a long time, but thank you so much for uh, talking about this project and for closing off the Fashion Moon Business uh, Week um, that we've had today. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.